The first thing I want to say is thank you. Because this has been an extraordinary experience for us. And uh, uh, your, your, your stories uh, are so important, uh, not just for us, because what, what you see in, in these cadets um, and our cadets that we've taken over the past seven years is ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And they're going to take what they learned back to West Point, and uh, that's why they have a videotape recorder that they'll charge every night <laughs> and, and take these stories back and take these ideas back and, and that's very important and, and we thank you for that because a lot of you those of you who've been in the military in the army in particular <clears throat> understand that a lot of the social change that we see today was started in the army mm -hmm. that's true you know, and, and, and uh, we're trying to perpetuate that we're starting small but we're working our way up to it so I, I first want to thank you for, for this amazing experience uh, and a wonderful lunch. <laughs> um, the second thing I want to do is ask uh, the cadets if you can go around the room uh, about your impressions, about what in particular would you like to hear, what, what they've seen so far. Overall, what you've seen, and then today, in, you know, this brief statement. <clears throat> well, uh, I guess something something that I saw today a lot, I mean, we really hit on is driving around and seeing gentrification. I come from a university town, and I didn't really see it in my hometown, but now I think about it, it's definitely there. And just the college towns around the country, I think that's a big problem. And it's a big problem everywhere, so driving around and really seeing it and pointing out the lines of like where it's happening is really impactful for me. But it's, it's been really powerful to drive around and see where civil rights has happened and then coming here and especially today hearing from people that were there and experienced were part of the movement. That's really powerful. But can I respond? I think that's a big statement you just made. A lot of people go to college and they go to college and stay on the campus. The education is around the college. So coming out to this community, <coughs> To see who they are, they do, why they do it. Learning what's going on in the community, it's called, I call it university town and gown. Because it's a shame if you come to a city, stay four years, go back home and have never found out what the neighbors do, who they are, and what their backgrounds are. So I'm, I'm glad you appreciate that. And I want to add to that, that the university perpetuates <clears throat> that it's not just the white students who don't get a chance to know right. what's in the community, but I've talked to black students who have gone to the University of Florida for four years and do not know where the black community is. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it, it's not just the white kids. So mm -hmm. Sorry. It's true. And, and one thing I want to point out, a good observation, in Vietnam in 1968, in Danang, where I was, I was affiliated with the first Marine and Business Force. We were Army aviators flying surveillance missions over the DMZ in the South China Sea. When we would get hit with one twenty two millimeter rockets, we went into underground bunkers, but one person had to be on top with machine guns make sure that samples didn't come in because samples wanted to blow the aircraft. Marines, when the daylight came, I had Marines trying to kill me. And the only way I didn't kill him is I had the safety on when I heard the shotgun snap and realized what was going on, other than that, I would have been dead today. Mm -hmm. So those are stories of racism. And it was a lot of folks were killed in Vietnam, not because of the enemy, but because of racism. But you'll get Thank you, sir. Yeah, that was certainly very interesting. <laughs> so I guess the, the original question was just like a brief statement, right? Yeah. If you move to do more. <laughs> right. So I, uh, I, I guess you never really realize how people are affected by things until you go and you get out and you look at what's actually happening on the ground. I just think it's very interesting to see the, the kind of uh, dynamic between how the civil rights movement has made 
great strides while at the same time we're almost reverting in other aspects of life. We see the resegregation of schools and we really see the gentrification of neighborhoods. And I just think it's so uh, appalling to know that while the civil rights movement has made such great strides and now we're here, what can we do to moving for move forward while we're actually moving backward? And that's uh, that, that's just very interesting and very concerning to me. And it was it was very it was a wonderful experience for me personally to get to see that firsthand because you you know it's one thing to read about it in all these books we read it's, it's a definite another to uh, go out and see it. So. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I really enjoyed hearing all of your stories. Um, uh, we did this uh, something similar in Okoye when we were there. Um, and I'm looking forward to just, um, you know, hearing more stories um, from people, like, regarding civil rights. Um, but one thing I noticed when I went out of the town, and I say this is a positive thing, is uh, all those blacks talking about the history of various places, I thought that was really cool, um, just a way to remember, you know, what happened in these places. So, I, I don't know when that started, but I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, to go off of that, I didn't realize kind of the issues that still linger in the South. Like, I'm from Rhode Island, I'm from the North, and this is like not necessarily gentrification. I really didn't notice. So just to see this and see it so obviously, it's just really interesting to me. And also, what I've noticed is like the sense of community you all have here is absolutely brilliant. Even in Okoe, I mean, I think that is the first step, and it's a really big step into making change, lasting change. Um, so I learned something, like maybe I should start getting involved in whatever communities I find at home, but I just think it's brilliant, the community you have here. So that's what I said. This experience has been really unique for me. Um, I live in Indiana, and our African American population around where I live is probably maybe 1%. So I don't get to see a lot of different cultures, it's very homogeneous. So growing up and in school, I never really learned about civil rights at all. I never knew it was an issue because no one talked about it. But coming here and seeing it firsthand, it makes me realize that this isn't history. It didn't happen like 600 years ago. It's going on now. Like I never thought about my mom and my grandma's age having to deal with this. So thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, during the class time period, like one of the activities we did last week was there was pictures placed around the classroom and we had to choose ones that like we wanted to talk about. And one of the pictures I chose was like a very young African American girl being escorted um, out of the school by three old like white officers. And one of the things that we talked about, like I just wondered, you know, what did her friends think? What would she go back and like tell the kids that were in her neighborhood going to this white school or like what did the parents have to go through and it's like so amazing hearing all of your stories you know that that you lived through that because it's it doesn't seem like like to actually have a conversation with someone that went through that is so much more so much richer than you know, what we, the activity we did do, like, that was really enlightening, but hearing it from someone that experienced it was truly amazing. Let, let me share one point. Uh, my involvement with the VFW when I came back to Jefferson County. Uh, anybody have any idea who Bruce Thomas was? Bruce Thomas was a sergeant in World War II that raised the flag on the team, I mean, the Mount Shibachi. Uh, when the Americans actually captured that mountain. And I had the, what I call the luxury of, of actually in his final days, kind of meeting President Obama allowed me to meet with Lieutenant General uh, Snowden, Lawrence Snowden, famous World War II Marine. And General Snowden was the commanding officer as a major at that time, and they actually ran the Japanese and Mount Shibachi along with Boots Thomas and raised that flag. But one of the things I just sent out to text yesterday, I found that in World War II, Lieutenant Colonel Charity Early was sent to France 
along with a postal battalion of 800 and some black females who were women on the court. <coughs> Just Memorial Day, Linda Martin, who was a pilot, just received her medals Memorial Day after 69 years mm -hmm. because they disbanded mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. unit once they came back from France. Mm -hmm. Very few people knew anything <coughs> about her. As a matter of fact, uh, she was a major when she was commander officer of that postal detachment in France. And four years after she had been a lieutenant colonel, the treatment was so bad to her. She only stayed in for four more years and retired. Of course, she worked in the Pentagon and brought about a lot of the changes that are here now. And so that's just a little, what I call a little known black history fact. And I, I was writing my little, what I call my little script sheet. I thought about each of you as leaders. And, and this is what my experience coming to be because I had political experience, I had state experience, I had local experience, and military experience. Most of you will be the generals of tomorrow making those major decisions because of your affiliation with the military academy. So you have to really prepare yourselves with what you're learning now to have that multi to background and to make good decisions that will impact a nation of people. And that's the thing I want to share with you. And, and I might also say in all of your life, wherever you are, in every aspect of your life, this should make an impact. Because you will, because with people, you have people experiences. And so you need to be able to um, Level leverage that with something greater than um, I saw one African American person to I have now built my own experience. So you have to take personal responsibility for doing that. There's nobody else will do it for you. But if you put yourself in the place where the knowledge is there, and you add to it, you add to it, you, add to it, you find out what's going on in every city. Or if there's something going on, Black History has yet to be written because they wrote this history. And so we're gathering African-American history. I learn all the time. I learned just this morning amazing things that I love and cherish. And I'm 81, and I've been doing this a while, but I'm always impacted by new knowledge. But if you see, during Black History Month at my school, everybody used to bring me the black books. I used to give them back. I said, I am black. I know black history. You read this book. I probably have already read this book. And then let us talk about it. Oh, Vivian, I saw a black picture break. You keep that picture and you learn what's on that picture. You see what I'm saying? You can't always, and I love having those things, but I would love it even more if I knew you had incorporated that into your life and your strategy so that we we'll learn more about each other so, so we can do better with where we are. We do have to work with today. And even though we have these old backgrounds, we are here today. We are very up to where we are and willing to be the caveat, willing to be the blender, willing to be the uh, whatever it takes, the catalyst to make it a better thing. And that's why we're doing all this. And that's why I'm so impressed with all of the things that I've learned because I thought, my goodness, I can take this back. I have some more to take back now to the people that I spoke. I was asked to do the commencement address for the college, for Santa Fe College. And uh, one of my friends <laughs> said to me, will the president read your speech first? I said, nobody reads my speech first. And, well, and if the president can read it, he can write it. You know, he's good to that. <laughs> well, the president asked me that because he has it. He understands. He knows what I talk about. My thing doesn't change. So my information to them was, I told them my story, the growing up in segregation and what all of that part. But then I said, now you wonder why I told you my story. I told you my story because until you don't like history, you don't know American history. That's it. So don't claim you know it until you know black history. Now I know there are other, other ethnic groups. The same thing applies, but think about this. We are the only group of people in America who didn't come from a land where we had a written history. 
our African history is well intact, but we created African American life here, and it is not written. But if I came from China, it's written. It's history written. From Asia, it's history written. Other parts of Asia. So my thing has always been to incorporate everybody, and love everybody. <laughs> but I tell one story, don't one I know. Uh, two things. <clears throat> one, I would I would like for the for the cadets to tell me. Um, what comes to mind when you think about, and not just the cadets, to the adults too, what comes to mind when you think about white privilege and what ooh, and ooh, ooh. what role you think white privilege has played in uh, the horrible stuff that has gone on for hundreds of years. And then the other thing I wanted to say is that um, I belong to a national organization where I'm so proud that we have over 15 members who are Native Americans and their story. Ooh. Please, I mean, ours is horrible, Ooh. theirs are too. So you, while you're learning about the hatred that hated, check the Native Americans out too. So white privilege. Um. I guess the fact that, like you were saying, black history isn't written. The fact that every, people will say, oh, I know history, and it's just ignored. And I think that that's something that's really, really it's, it's sad, and I think it's wrong. And I think that that's, to have like, this privilege to say, yeah, this is what history is, and it should only be your history, I don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We always call it his story. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. let, let me share one other point. And you mentioned something from Native America. <coughs> I was telling someone earlier, my great great grandmother, Margaret, mm -hmm. demise at 118 years old. She was a slave. But because of her living with the Cherokee and the Seminoles in North Florida, that was, that, that was the shield. And I do another speech about uh, Fort Mose. I talked a little bit about it when I was here in March. And black folk, slaves, other slaves from South Carolina and other areas, and even as far as Georgia, came to San Augustine because they knew that if they pledged their allegiance to the King of Spain when Florida was under Spain and converted to the Catholic religion, they were free black families. And they lived at Fort Mose and they protected. There was a captain that basically led a militia there. Also in my area, it was the Indians and their protecting black slaves, uh, alive black slaves that and until General Andrew Jackson came through and just eradicated everybody when Florida became a territory, well, it was a territory. But my experience, again, it goes back when I talked about civil rights. When I got back home and joined the post-military organization at American Legion VFW, Booth Thomas Post did not accept black military people. The first black state commander <coughs> from St. Pete came to me and said, I need you to make a difference in Jefferson County. And so I formed VFW Post 251, recruited over a hundred and some people, both white and black, in that post. And then in 2005, when I was elected, their first district commander with the nine counties, to, that's why we always jump in my, what I call jump, but it's awards and everything. I had to totally pull the chart as a district commander because Booch Thomas Post only had 21 members, less than 25 required for charter, and they did not want to actually obey the Constitution bylaws, which BFW is formed by the Congress of the United States. And so I had to totally pull their charter and disband them. That's great. Thank you. Wow. Um, so, so 
if, if I can get back to your question. Yes, that's <coughs> I'm going to talk to the second part of it first. Okay. And then the first part the second. So we, we, we don't focus our study only on African Americans. We, our study is, is broader than that. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've uh, uh, dealt with issues uh, such as the <coughs> Japanese American internment during mm -hmm. World War II. We visited the Rower and uh, uh, Jerome uh, internment camps in Arkansas mm -hmm. uh, on one of our trips. We went to the Japanese American uh, uh, Veterans Museum in McGee, Arkansas. We didn't know it was there, but the year before we had passed by, saw a sign. Wow. <coughs> we should look into this. And we actually went in Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, at the time, you know, the uh, Department of Labor was run by very good people, uh, and they had a whole program with Japanese American veterans who fought in World War II mm -hmm. as part of the most decorated uh, unit in mm -hmm. Uh, the United States Army and would come back from from uh, uh, Europe and visit their families in the tournament camps. Mm. Uh, we we have have uh, gone to Native American sites. Uh, we plan. We've been talking about uh, uh, doing this and starting <coughs> in the Midwest and, and doing uh, a Native, actually a Native American civil rights staff right. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, for the three. <laughs> not, not a tough question. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't really talked about it too much as a group, but this is a great time to talk about it. Um, there, there is white privilege, and uh, nothing, nothing makes it clearer to me than when I talk with some of my colleagues who are African Americans, and they tell me about their daily lives. And uh, especially, I talk. I talk with uh, senior army personnel at West Point, uh, African Americans who are, you know, like the best people we have. And they tell me what they have to do when uh, they're driving their car, mm -hmm. and uh, they see a, a light behind it, mm -hmm. and how they have to act. And you know, you see that the, the total difference between what uh, a white officer will answer, you know, they're gonna scramble to get out their registration and license, mm -hmm. and you know, these guys, uh, I think I told you cadets about them, that were like uh, sergeant majors or, or high-ranking officers, uh, retired officers, they're there with their hands on the wheel, mm -hmm. and you know what that's for. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have to tell their children this, and that kills them, <clears throat> okay? When, when, I'm going to just, when I tell a story, I can't stick to the story. I I wanted to just say that this community is, you're going to succeed. Because when you produce people like Colonel Harvin over there, I'm not very proud of her. She's very modest. Yes. Yeah, so but, you know, She's an extraordinary officer. She's an extraordinary lawyer, mm -hmm. extraordinary teacher, and, and you know, the best thing that, that I can take it possibly have, have and, and she she's, she's, makes this thing happen. But when she tells me that she has to tell her son mm -hmm. about this, mm -hmm. it, it, it's revolting. And uh, I think it's something that we, we we have to talk about because a lot of uh, people whose skin uh, is uh, the color of mine uh, don't think about it. They don't have to think about it. And that's wrong. That's wrong. Uh, Professor, you were talking about uh, uh, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. So last year we were in Oldham, Georgia, and the woman uh, docent was taking us through the, the Albany Civil Rights Institute um, and uh, she came to the picture of the three of them and she, she was telling the story to the cadets this was our, this is again this is a, our second day as it is today of our staff right and she pointed them you know to uh, uh, Schwerner and Goodman and she she said uh, see these two guys 
They're not white. Yeah. And same skin color as mine. Mm-hmm. They're Jewish. And, and she distinguished between them. And I, 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 I sort of, I like that. Because, you know, white is, is really not the color of your skin. It's the sense of, of power or powerlessness. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, in America today, it, it, it makes more, it, it matters. And it's always mattered. Yeah. But, you know, with a community like this, doing the things you're doing, talking about it, and with cadets like this that, that will spread the word, we, we can change that. I really believe we can change that. Mm-hmm. So, that, that's... I want to know another student thinks about white privilege. So, can you hear that term? Mm-hmm. White privilege? We're going to go around. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Oh no! I want to yeah. say a okay. couple. I want to say a couple of things. First, I want to say that I applaud you for not keeping it binary, black and white. That <clears throat> you're looking at the human experience under uh, atrocities or oppression, and I think that's a great thing because we're, we're a human family. Now we all represent our interests and our cultures, and that's good. But my parents were very diverse in their raising of us, and so we rep- we recognized and accepted and associated with the human family and that meant Native Americans, white, uh, Jewish people. And I want to say that the abolitionist movement was not just black people fighting for the rights of black people. We had other humans um, that were also participating. And the civil rights movement, again, it was not just black people fighting for civil rights because civil rights are human rights. But you had um, Catholic priests, you had Jewish rabbis, and you had white people participating. And so it looked a lot like the human family. So we want to keep in mind um, the human family, because it's just the one race. Um, um, What's his name? He would always say, what is race? Is something to be run? Because there is only one race, and that is the human race. The human family. So, kudos. I won't be sure. <clears throat> but until we get there, until we get there, America, we've got to do some work. I want to be thought of as the one race, one, one, but I, we're not there yet. We are not. And until you know my story and <clears throat> know what to do with the it, we are not there. And I, if you're Jewish, if you're this, if, whatever, if your skin is light and you can walk in the door and I can't, you get my drift? So I have got to reach to be where you are. You have got to see me. And when I talk, I t- my friend said to me, I don't see you as black. I said, then you hurt my feelings. Oh, as big no, as I am right. and as black as I am, you have got to see me as black. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want you to tell me that. <laughs> you know, I said, I don't want you to see me as your friend as an equal friend because I see you as white. You see what I'm saying? And so we can do this, and I want us always to feel, because I feel comfortable here. I feel around. But uh, there's, a, there's a reason that we're trying to get the story told in Universal, and it's so we can all get on the same page. Okay, let's make sure we hear all from our uh, oh, cadets yeah, first. Okay, I won't say anymore. Anymore. <laughs> Okay. All right, so when you said white privilege, the very first thing that came to my mind was, I did an activity in um, a leadership conference last summer where we all lined up on the start line and there was a finish line and it was a very diverse group and they they asked us questions They said take a step forward if you've never had to worry about where your food was coming from or take a step back if you had to work a job in high school and we all ended up at different points some people were almost to the finish line some people were way behind the start line and that really illustrated for me that it's not what we're doing now, but white privilege is where we come from and what we didn't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. It's being closer to the finish line just because you didn't have to worry about the same things. Mm -hmm. And they said, go, and of course the people that were way closer to the finish line finished first, no matter how hard the people in the back tried. Mm -hmm. And to me that really illustrated white privilege. Good lesson, yes. And that is the truth of the society. Yes. Great. Um, Yeah, so, Kind of going off of that, I was thinking, white privilege to me, I don't think because you're white here that you're privileged. I mean, there's a lot of, you hear a lot of really, really poor white families. Like, my mom was an immigrant from Romania, she had it hard, and she was white. So, but in regards to 
African Americans. Um, <coughs> they're just starting line. And I think white people are here and African Americans are like way back mm -hmm. here. And that was the cause kind of all the white privilege and the slavery and the cruelty and everything that mm -hmm. happened back in America's history. Um, so I think now, in the 21st century, we're also playing catch up. The African American community is playing catch up. Um, so, and I, I don't know, uh, like, I don't know how apparent white privilege is now. I think it differs in some areas and some degrees, but I do think it exists. And I think we have a lot more work to do to, to become really equality, like true equality. You know what, you, you, we have to learn the word equity. Yes. See, because equity is the blacks are here, the whites are here, and we need the blacks to get here. Well, they keep giving, they say, well, we'll, we'll we give uh, both of them a million dollars. Yeah. Well, that just shoots the whites up it further and put the blacks there. So we got to make sure that the other people are here before we can talk equality. And I just learned that. I just want to share. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even, I don't care where you came from to America. If your skin is light, in this conversation, you are white. Mm -hmm. You have to know that. I'm not looking at Jewish, Romanian. I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at the fact that you came into America white and you could walk in the door and get a job and I couldn't. That, that's the bottom line. I'm looking at you could get a, a house in this neighborhood and I couldn't. I don't and care where you came from. Your mama you had came a from with skin. Job. <laughs> yes, you came from both of us looking at a job, and I, you get to go in the door, and I don't. You had cut, I'm looking at the fact that you walked in the front door of the doctor's office, and I walked in the back cubby hole. Now I don't care. If they aren't going to ask you what country you're from until later on. But you're already in the door. They aren't going to try to ask me if I came from Britain or wherever. <laughs> they don't care. They're just looking at the color of my skin. And I don't get in the door. So you have to, and that's a deep place to go. But until we go there, yes. we have to know that the system, the system is already set up to put us on the other side. And so you have to know that, yes, it exists. And at the level, I am white. I don't care where I came from to get to America. That's what America's all about. And everybody else, the Statue of Liberty said, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. She didn't tell us that. We were already free. We didn't come here because we wanted to. We were brought here and we we're not yearning to be free. We were already free. And we came in mass and we came under great duress. We are still under great duress. And so that is the difference between <clears throat> having white privilege and not having, even if you say I'm not privileged, oh yeah, as long as you walk in white shoes, you are, you didn't choose to be, but you are. And that's what you have to get conceptualized. Yes. Okay. Um, well, a lot of it's been said already, but I guess the first place my mind goes is to, uh, when I think of white privilege is education. Um, just like, it's the root of so many um, disparities within the, uh, black and white communities because if you're white, like the fact is you're more likely to go to a school that's better funded, you know, maybe on like a different side of town, <coughs> uh, the wealthier part of that. <coughs> um, and so that creates like, that's, I would say that's the source of a lot of, um, a lot of the white people which we see today, just, you know, even like with police, they go into a lower income area um, with people who are less educated because they didn't, they didn't have the privilege of being born into a wealthier community. Um, so that's why you see, you know, maybe like an increase in police brutality, brutality there. So that's where my mind goes. Good, different, thank you. Different perspective. <clears throat> All right, so I kind of want to take Cadet Regine's point and Miss Vivian's point and kind of kind of put them together. But I want everyone to bear with me because what I'm about to say is might be a little insidious. That's all right. Um, that's all right. We'll get there. Um, we got you. The privilege, the privilege afforded to me by being the skin color that I am, was not afforded to me by being the skin color I am. It was afforded to me by being by not being the skin color other people are. It's not having to worry when I get pulled over. It's not having to worry when I apply for a job. It's not having to question what I put on my college application. 
it's it's accruing wealth since the very start of the country and not picking up X years <laughs> afterward. So I, I, when I think of white privilege, I don't think about it as this, <clears throat> this inherent thing that you receive by being a certain skin color. I think it's all things you don't have to deal with because of the skin color that you aren't, which I really think is what she was trying to say, and it's what Miss Vivian was trying to say as well. So, You're a that's what I got. Yeah. <laughs> I love the draw. <laughs> For example, you guys remember the situation with Dr. Gates when he was going to his own, his house, own house? But because yeah. he was black, yeah. he was arrested. Yeah, he he, because he didn't have Because somebody called the police. He yeah. said there was someone suspicious. Mm -hmm. And eventually he didn't, I guess, Bow down to the white officer and shuffle like he expected. He acted like he was at like, his house. Exactly, he was arrested. And Trayvon Martin looked suspicious mm -hmm. in the neighborhood, and mm -hmm. he ended up dead. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's like it's not having to worry about wearing a hoodie. It's it's mm -hmm. not it's not worrying about driving a nice car and wondering is someone going to think that I, I stole this yeah, because they're drugs. Yeah, drugs. Yeah, or drugs. You can't have that right. kind of doing drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know. That I like all your thoughts. I like all of your thoughts because as long as you're thinking, mm -hmm. we're all going to get it right. We're going to get it right. And it just to know that mm. it's it isn't something that has been. It is alive and well and ticking with the clock. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's all over. I, I my son was in the hospital down in South Florida in a place called uh, uh, Oxford, Florida. And I tell you, I am a big mouth person, but I treaded on water yes, there, yes. and, and I, because rebel flags are everywhere, Fox News is on every TV, I almost had an accident, and there were two people sitting on the motorcycle, and I had to swerve my car for, to keep from getting hit, and you think they would have come on and said something to me? Oh no, they just looked at me like I was, and I got myself out of there, because I knew that I was not in friendly territory. Now that's today. That's not when my daddy was almost lit. That is today. So they, we have not done the work. All of you need to be listening, and you are listening. And what you do is going to make a big difference because there still is work to be done. At the end of my TED talk, I, we talked. Students asked, "What can be done?" I said, "You have to pick up from where we left off and still work toward a goal because we have not reached it. We didn't reach it, and so we we got to get there." And I'll add to this point here. Yeah. This young man has. I'm sorry. No, you can go ahead. I'm sorry. Go, 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 go. I was going to say uh, white privilege to me, and I guess this is really like kind of close to home issue with West Point, especially, that really frustrates me is uh, it's being able to look at someone else's achievements and saying they didn't earn it, especially now. Like, that's a problem a lot of cadets do, is they look at the black students or the minority students we have, and they're like, well, they didn't work hard to get here. They're here because they have wow. a different color skin. Mm -hmm. And they think, they think they didn't try as hard or they're getting something they didn't deserve. And that's, that's a big problem for me. And it's ignoring what you had privilege to you and not what other people didn't have. So when people get in and they, they look at lower test scores from other cadets, and that was a big thing is they released test scores and like who got what test scores based off race. And they're like, well, the black scores are lower, but no one looks at their own community and realizes that, well, I got classes on the SAT. I had study sessions. There was this wealth in the community that was privileged that I got this advantage over other people. And then you look at others like, well, you're not trying hard. You're not, you didn't work for it to get here. And that's frustrating for me. And I think that extends everywhere. I think white privilege, I mean, anywhere white people are, which is everywhere, is that uh, it's a pervading issue, and I think it affects everything. I don't, I don't think you can really escape it everywhere, because people look at race inherently. I think white people are just have that privilege naturally, and it comes from the long history of the United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just hit the nail in the Yeah, one, one more. Here. One more. Yes. Yeah, a lot of great things already been said. But um, when I think about white privilege, I think about, um, you know, a lot of people are either ignorant of it or they just want to not believe that it's alive and well. Um, I think it's not just, you know, over generations accumulated 
injustices that um, you know African Americans have faced versus white families that have put them at different starting points. Um, but also just today, you know, walking into a store or whatever, I know that I'm always going to get the benefit of the doubt. Um, mm -hmm. I know other people um, don't. So um, yeah, but I think it's largely unacknowledged. Mm -hmm. What do we can respond to? Based on my experience, I probably have more multi-versatile experience uh, than a lot of folks, even in the state of Florida. Having done first of a lot of things, chief deputy state fire marshal, the chairman of the board of county commissioners of my county. The political institution probably is the greatest enforcer of white privilege concepts. That's where it's got to be broken down first. Uh, when I was elected to the Board of County Commissioners, and when I was Chief Deputy State Fire Marshal, I got locked up at the airport in Tampa because I had a gun in my carry -on. The only reason I had it because the law provided me, I was a Chief Deputy Law Enforcement person for the whole state of Florida, <coughs> investigating a crime case in West Palm Beach. And because of the plane was late getting into uh, Tampa, I had to carry my luggage on the little commuter that was going on to West Palm. And of course, when I went through the security check, I knew they was going to get it. There was the gun in there, the four head clay, and I'm telling the guy, hey, I'm authorized to carry that. They locked me up, and only when they started illegally searching my luggage, they found my badge as a chief deputy fire marshal of the state of Florida, and they want to apologize and all of that. No, no, you just didn't listen to me. I told you I was authorized to get it. on 995 going to investigate the place. FHB, 1 o'clock in the morning, pulled me over. I did the same thing. My, my son is a police detective for the city of Tampa, so I know all of those caveats. And he come up and say, what are you doing? He was walking all over the road. I said, I'm not going to argue with you. You're very incorrect. I'm headed towards Jacksonville, Florida for a reason. And he said, why is that? Because I am a law enforcement officer just like you are. My badge is in my glove compartment. I'm a chief deputy state fire marshal for the whole state of Florida. I've got offices all over the state. Oh, well, you go head on and go where you're going and everything. There, there was another incident going on, but those are the kind of situations. And politically, I lost my re-election in 2014 because as the chairman of the Board of County Commissioners, as I said when I was talking, I'm a change maker. I make a difference in a community for all people, not just one. Because in the year being a chair of the Board of County Commissioners, we paid over 51 miles of dirt roads in the black community that had not been touched. And then we built a $1.5 million fire station <coughs> shacks. Because I used to be the fire chief. And I said, I am not going to sit here and look at those guys that providing permanent services to our citizens and living in the shack. Even the ambulance sitting out in the rain when you have yes. responses with medications that's mm -hmm. supposed to be secured and all of that. So I put the, the resolution on the floor and it passed. And because of that, I was not really, I lost my re-election by seven votes. So from the political perspective, you have to remember government is a microcosm from national, state, and local. You have judicial, legislative and the executive branch at all levels. When you look at government the way it is now, unless you start making those changes there because those folks are in those positions are the people that's going to make the decision who gets what, when, how, and how much. So until we can get all our mindsets, we're going to make this a great nation. This never was Make America Great Again. That was something I was going to talk about. But register to vote. Yeah, we have to get our minds set to that point. Can we hear from Miss Felicia? I'm not okay. Felicia. I'm, Felicia. Felicia. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Lieutenant yeah. Colonel. <laughs> no, my no, bad. Um, I just think it. Um,
to answer your question about white privilege, I mean, I think you, you see it. You see it on the TV. You just saw it with that college scandal that just went on. Oh, because yeah. they can buy into that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have the resources, any of that, that is truly, truly a problem. You know, um, I, I think back to Brian Stevenson when he talked on his TED Talk. And he said, he was talking about what is capital punishment. And he said capital punishment is when you don't have capital, you get punished. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, wonderful, wonderful talk um, that he has on TED Talk. But that's, that's an essence of what he's saying. And so that's what it is. It's sometimes being able to cut the line because of, you know, a color, that the color of your skin. And I, and I look at it in some cases of, you know, we've used that and we've, you know, with a lot of these things with Plessy, you know, they picked certain folks because they looked white, because those were the ones that they wanted to challenge the system. It wasn't that they weren't black, one ain't black, but that, that skin color, that was a way to test the system. And so it goes back to showing that, you know, skin color is playing a role and a part of it. Um, and that we have some ways to go. We still have some work to do. This has been truly, truly a great visit. Um, we would like to just take a minute to um, tell you how appreciative we are. Some of the cadets want to present our panelists with um, some just tokens just to say thank you for that. And I just need a quick break. <laughs> I'm still working that behind the scenes. Okay, okay. Uh, so just give me one moment. Okay. And uh, in the moment, I want to say, uh, Chris Rock, everybody knows who Chris yeah, Rock is, yeah. right? Chris, Chris Rock <laughs> says, that, says that he's a millionaire, uh -huh. but he can't find a white man who trade places with him, a poor white man to trade places with him. Because <laughs> even with all the money he's got, the white person got more privilege yeah, than he has. has. He's right. Yeah, he's so. Right. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm good with, um, I know there's privilege, but here's what I want to say. We can jump, we got rhythm, and um, a whole lot of other um, things that we can do that are cultural, and so we can compare. So I don't really want to trade places. Mm -hmm. I just want to stay black and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I will not just be a teacher, I also want to be a friend. So, friendship is on the table for me. Oh, okay. Second that. I love being of African descent. I think I'm, I, I really try to tone it down. Yeah. My, my pride. But I I well, because I know where I came from hey. and where you all came from, yeah. it just... Yeah. And, and how about that free tan we rock? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's free tan. Oh, yeah. And you know, oh, yeah. it's probably more important than that is the fact What's that more we have to do that for ourselves because we, in America, we were always put down. Until Jane Brown came along and said, I'm said black what? And I'm said it loud. I'm black. It was not good to be black. Yeah. It was not good to call yourself black. We, we use it as a dirty word, but Jane Brown said, it's all right. So you don't even know the, the, the impact yeah. of that. Say it loud, say what? I'm black and I'm proud. I am not hearing what you said I am anymore. I know who I am. I'm black and I'm proud. Yes. So that, that's what we are saying. We're your friend, but we're sure black. Oh, right on through. Yes. Well, I, I, I love being a teacher yeah. at West Point. <laughs> I thank you all for giving me the opportunity. All right, so a couple of presentations that we want to do, cadets that are presenting, will you go next to the person that you're presenting to? Okay, I'm trying to get it. Okay, and we'll start, um, we'll start here. All right, well, there's Ms. Vivian. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us today. I really enjoyed your story. I hope I can hear more later. So as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you with this. Oh, I'm going to cherish this. <laughs> you are a West Point professor. Oh, gee, I'm going to put this in the newspaper. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. We just want to thank you so much for hearing your stories and all the work that you've done and letting us come into your space and hear from you and all your stories. And it's just really great. And we just want to say thank you.